Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to start a series on my favorite field of math, knot theory. And I'll begin with a challenge. Go get a rope, or a string, or cable, or floss, or whatever you have on hand, and lay it flat on the table in front of you. Then pick up one end of the rope in each hand. Now, without letting go of either end, Tie a knot into your rope. Pause the video here and give it a go. After struggling a bit, you'll probably realize that's harder than it sounds. You might get frustrated and come to the conclusion that it just can't be done. But equally frustrating is the fact that there's no obvious reason why it should be difficult. To understand what's going on, we're going to need to learn some knot theory. Before we go any further, we should probably ask, what's a knot? Intuitively, it's what you get when you twist up a bit of string so that it stays twisty. But what does that mean mathematically? Well, there are a lot of details here that can be abstracted away. We don't care if the knot is made of thick rope or thin string or tangled headphone cables. We don't care if the knot is hanging loosely on the string or pulled tight. We don't even care if the strands of the knot get wiggled around a bit. Really, the only important feature is that the string can't pass through itself. So we may as well assume that the string is infinitely thin, infinitely stretchy, and frictionless. You know, all of those things that make the physicists cry. Now, that presents us with a few problems. First, if we try to draw a picture of an infinitely thin knot, there's no way to tell which strand is on top at each of the crossings. In the physical knot, we can figure that out from information like the shadows. But for a knot diagram like this one, we have to use a convention. And the standard is to draw a little gap around each crossing to show which strand is on top. There's a more substantive problem here, though. If we can manipulate the string as much as we like, what's to stop us from just feeding one end of the string backward through the loop until the knot gets undone? There are a few ways to resolve this issue. We could fix the ends of the string to two walls, so we're forced to keep all of our actions in the middle of the string. Or we could stretch the ends off to infinity with the same result. But the convention knot theorists have agreed on is to just take the ends of the string and fuse them together to create a single unbroken loop. These approaches all turn out to be equivalent, so we aren't losing anything by picking this one, and it's generally the easiest to work with. So, a knot is just a thin, stretchy, closed loop that might or might not have some twists in it. If you prefer a formal topological definition, it's the continuous injective image of a circle into 3D space or really the equivalence class of such images under ambient isotopy, but the informal definition will be just fine for our purposes. It's a string with the ends stuck together. Let's play around a bit to get a feel for how knots work. Here we have two diagrams which look pretty different, but I claim they're really two pictures of the same knot, known as the trefoil. To prove that, all we have to do is transform one into the other. We're allowed to move and stretch the rope as much as we like to get there. The only constraint is that we can't pass one strand through another. In this case, all we need to do is take this top strand and pull it down to the bottom. If we draw a diagram of that, we get a shape that looks like this. And then we can straighten that out a bit to end up with a shape like this. So we started with a knot that looked like this and ended up 
with this shape. And since we never broke the loop along the way, that means these must be pictures of the same knot. Now I want you to try it out for yourself. Take your rope from earlier and tie it into this shape, known as the figure eight knot, and tape the ends together so you have a closed loop. And then transform that into its mirror image and draw out all of the steps along the way. Pause here and take a few minutes to puzzle it out. If you worked through that exercise, you probably realized there are a lot of ways that you can manipulate a string. There's a lot of freedom, which is great for playing around, but with so many options, it makes it hard to reason about knots and harder to prove anything. When we find ourselves overwhelmed with possibilities like this, it's often helpful to start listing simple cases and see if we can gain any insight. In this case, that means drawing out some of the simplest knot moves we can make. So let's try that and see what we can learn. The first thing to notice is that the crossings are really the important part of a knot, so what happens between them doesn't matter all that much. So we're free to move the strands between crossings as much as we like, so long as we don't cross them over themselves or each other. And we can also slide a crossing along a strand, so long as it doesn't bump into the next crossing. And all of this stuff that doesn't add or rearrange crossings is known as planar isotopy. Okay, but what if we do want to change the crossings? Well, the simplest thing we could do is take a strand and add a loop to it. That introduces a new crossing like so. If we draw that in a diagram, we get something like this. Or we could take two adjacent strands and pull one over the other. In a diagram, that looks like this. Or we could take a strand that's next to a crossing and pull it over to the other side. And of course, all of these moves are reversible. You can go the other way. Now, you might suspect that we could just keep on listing cases forever and our set of moves would just keep growing. But it turns out we don't need to. This is a complete list. These moves, known as the Reitermeister moves, are the building blocks that make up every move you can make with a knot. The full proof is mostly just a lot of casework, but I'll leave a link in the description if you're curious. To see it in action, let's try this transformation again, but this time using only the Reitermeister moves. We'll start by adding a loop with R1, and then we'll take this strand across this one with R2. We'll move this strand over this crossing with R3. We'll move this strand over this strand with another R2. And then this is getting a little messy, so let's just rearrange here. We aren't changing any of the crossings, so this is just planar isotopy. Then we pull this strand over this crossing with another R3. We undo the loop with another R1. And then finally, one more round of planar isotopy gives us our final result. So once again, we've transformed this diagram into this one, but this time using only the Reitermeister moves. And you can see that we're really doing the same thing we did before. If you follow the path of the top point, this black dot, it is just going from top to bottom all the way across. But now we're doing it one small step at a time. As a final exercise for you, try converting your transformation of the figure eight into one composed of these Reitermeister moves. Now let's get back to our original challenge of tying a knot without letting go of the rope. We want to be in a position with one hand on each end of the rope, which means the rope, your arms, and your body 
will form a closed loop. And as we've said, that's a knot. So what we're trying to do is a transformation that takes that loop and puts a knot into the rope. And that's where we want to end up, a position that looks like this with a knot in the middle of the rope. So let's work backwards and try to straighten that rope out. We can do that with a series of transformations. Stretch this loop around this hand, then stretch this loop around this one, and so on. And you can follow along and check that all of these are valid transformations. And we end up in a position like this, where the rope is straight, but your arms are knotted. That may look painful in a diagram, but it's just crossing your arms. So if you start by picking up the rope with your arms crossed, then you can follow these moves backward, or just uncross your arms, to tie a knot in the rope. So with a little bit of knot theory, we've solved our problem. But hang on a second. We just showed that you can tie a knot if you do cross your arms, but we haven't actually proved that you can't tie a knot if you don't. That is, we didn't prove that an unknotted loop is different from the trefoil. In fact, we haven't even shown that there are knots that can't be undone. To do that, we're going to need to dive deeper into knot theory. So join me next time when we'll talk about invariance and coloring. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.